Here we are with Unit 5, Lesson 8, Linear Functions. We're going to investigate a little bit more into linear functions. The first part of this, Bigger and Smaller, talks about Diego and May, and they are comparing these three graphs that are given. Uh, Diego says that the graphs are ordered from smallest to largest. May says that they're ordered from largest to smallest. But these are the graphs, not numbers. So what do you think? Uh, do you agree with D or do you agree with May? I'd like for you to go ahead and go through that. My personal opinion, uh, I could agree with either one simply because of the direction that we're going. I see a graph that's decreasing and then staying in a flat line and then increasing. So going from high to low to high. Uh, I, I think that there's a few other ways that we could also recognize this, but I'd like to know what you think. Go ahead and leave a comment below about 8.1, who you think and, and why. 8.2 is proportional relationships define linear functions. And what we're after, this is a key thing to look at this, proportional relationships, so we recognize this piece that proportional relationships pass through the origin. And it's kind of cool that it says that they define linear functions. So anytime you have a proportional relationship, you have a linear equation, and that linear equation will be a function. So we know that these are straight lines. We know that these inputs have just a unique output. Let's go ahead and break them apart and, and uh, decide what's going on. Jade uh, or Jada earned $7 per hour mowing her neighbor's lots. Name two quantities in this situation that are in a functional relationship. Which two did you choose to be, or which did you choose to be independent and which is of the variables depends on it? Well, if we're looking at this, Jade is earning $7 every single hour. And with that kind of information, that's that's enough. I would wonder how many hours is Jade actually um, mowing for? And then the other thing I wonder about is how much money did she earn? And with those two factors, those are a couple of, I wonder what's going on here and how much of which they are because they can change all the way through. And so these are my two quantities that I want to focus on in this situation. Um, with these two quantities, I have to think about which one is independent, so which one stands alone, and which one depends on the other. Now, obviously, she can't make money if she doesn't work. So the money earned has to be the dependent variable. And that would leave the time as the independent variable. I know that the independent variable as the number of hours is our x variable and dependent would have to be y. So now when I write an equation that represents this function, I'm not necessarily going to be thinking about the letters and the numbers. I'm going to think about what the situation tells me. And so I'm going to say Jada's money earned is equal to $7 every hour. On the next page, when we look at this, there's a graph of a function. We're going to label the axes and label at least two points with input-output pairs. So we look at this graph here, and we would take our independent value, the number of hours, and over here we would talk about the money earned. Now, because of where this line is, I have to think about how I'm going to uh, write my intervals here. And so what I do with it is I just really need to think about if this is one hour, this is two hours, this is three hours, I need to be really careful to just come on up here and label a point or graph a point like this and then come back across. And that's where I'm going to label my $7. And then I'll come here from the two up to the point and remember this is all approximation because there's not a grid line here for me to be able to follow but i can set, start setting it up to understand that one hour there's seven dollars two hours there's twenty there's fourteen dollars three hours there's twenty one dollars and what you start to see is that the spacing between each of these tick marks is approximately the same now i think that one might be just a little bit wider than the others but you kind of get the idea and then I just need to label these and recognize that there's 1 and 7, 2 and 14, 3 and 21. And these are all solutions of the function that, right, that talks about how the money that she earned depends on the number amount of time that she works and that we have a value of increasing $7 every single hour. 
next situation is to convert feet to yards. You multiply the number of feet by one third. Well, if we're talking about the number of yards to feet, what it looks like here is if I'm multiplying my number of yards by one third, or number of feet by one third, that would indicate to me that um, that's the multiplication would be happening right here and would indicate to me that feet are the independent variable. So when I talk about this, I have the number of feet and I have the number of yards. When I talk about these two pieces here, <clears throat> I talk about feet being the input because the input is being multiplied by one third and then the output is the yards. The other piece of this that helps me to understand that the feet is independent and the yards are dependent is because it's saying from feet to yards. And so the yards must be dependent on the number of feet, making this the dependent and then the number of feet independent. And so we take our equation and we say the number of yards is dependent on one third the number of feet. And you'll notice again, I didn't say any of the, the actual letters or the or that go with this, the letters of the variables. I'm talking about the values that are given. So when we draw a graph of the function, we need and label these two points. What we need to remember here is that the number of feet is given for x and the number of yards is given for y. And this is where some background knowledge will also help us. Um, if I know that I have three feet in one yard, I can set it up like that. So three feet in one yard. So that'd be one, and this would be one, two, three. And I could continue that pattern of four, five, six for another foot. That pattern would continue on as long as I could possibly could. Now that I have a couple of points, I can make a line that's going to be straight. I can graph these data because this is continuous data, meaning that every single point along the graph will work. And then just for these two that I have on here, I would recognize this is one yard is, equal, or excuse me, yeah, <laughs> I have it wrong. Three feet is one yard and six feet is two yards. And you can see that as I build that, I would see the same proportional relationship all the way out. So remember proportional relationships are always functions. They're always linear and uh, they'll always work for us in the case when we talk about that functional relationship as long as we decide and we determine what the dependency is uh, from one variable to the next variable. That'll be something, a skill that we can use right here, although this is not going to be linear relationships or proportional relationships, but we'll see what happens. There's four tanks of water. The amount of water in gallons, A, in tank A is given by the function A equals 200 plus 8T. I think what I want to do is I want to do this. I want to go tank one. I'm going to go ahead and write these off to the side just so I don't lose track of any of them. So tank A, 200, whoops. The amount of water in there is equal to 200 plus eight times T. Now, if I start to interpret this, I think where, where T is in minutes, I think that might help me as well. Um, this tank right here is starting with 200 gallons. And then fills eight gallons a minute. Okay. And I know that based on, I'm talking about the total number of gallons. So the total number of gallons is equal to 200. So I already start out with that because it's a positive value and it must be increasing in its volume because this is plus 80. If we look at the amount of gallons in, or the gallon of gallons B in tank B that starts at 400 gallons and is decreasing. So second tank has B gallons which is equal to 400 minus five, five gallons per minute. So there's our, our function right there. And I would see that we start out with 400 gallons. 
and so it's draining so the gallons are decreasing we see that, that decreasing value is draining five gallons per minute all right here's another important piece of this that says these functions work when t is greater than or equal to zero and t is less than or equal to 80. another way to represent this right here would be to say that the time is going to be greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to 80. So what it's providing for us is a range of time when this will work. And we're gonna find out why that's so important to help us out. <clears throat> it says, which tank started out with more water? Well, I think we're only talking about tank A and tank B. That's all we're given, or the first two tanks. Of the two of them, tank A has 200 to start, tank B has 400, so we would say tank B Um, I just let's let's make this really good. Tank B, um, tank A has two hundred gallons, while tank B has four hundred gallons. Now you might seem like it might seem like that's kind of redundant and like it's kind of obvious, but what I'm doing here is I'm making a claim that tank B is the one that started out with more water, and then I'm providing evidence for my claim. So my my um, claim is tank B, evidence is tank A has 200, B has 400. So it's pretty obvious which one it is by putting the evidence. Write an equation representing the relationship between between B and T. Well, I kind of already did that right here not kind of, I did do that. The total volume in water, the amount of gallons is B. The tank has 400 gallons in it and it's draining five gallons per minute. So it says one tank is filling up, the other is draining out. Which is which? How can you tell? Tank A is filling. And the reason we know is because it is a positive slope or a positive constant rate. not T. Okay, and tank B is draining. And for the same thing, the same reason, but it's it's just the opposite. We can see that it has a negative constant rate. There we go. Um, I should probably put gallons per minute. Okay, here's our third tank. The amount of water in gallons C in tank C is given by the function. So here's our third tank. C is equal to 800 minus 7T. Is it filling or draining out? Can you tell this just by looking at the equation? I certainly can tell that it is draining and it's because of the constant rate. Draining because constant rate. of minus 7 t means minus 7 gallons per minute. All right, hope that makes sense there. So the graph of the function for the amount of water in gallons d in tank d at time t is shown. Is it filling or draining out? Well, this one, they actually don't give us any specific information or specific data, but we do see that my graph is decreasing. It's starting from this line right here, and it's dropping all the way down to right here. Based on the information that I was given, this is any amount of time that would have been in minutes. And this one, D, is the water in the tank. And what I see is over time the water in the tank is decreasing. And so what I see with this is that it is draining. 
and all because I see where it's at. But I have to be able to interpret that and using a graph to be able to see that by understanding what my input or independent variable is compared to my output really helps to make sense of the situation. All right, uh, the last part that we're going to do is 8.4. You're welcome to go ahead and try. They already ready for more. But I'm going to go ahead and pass it up. 8.4, which is growing faster. Noah is depositing money in his account every week to save money. The graph shows the amount he has saved as a function of time since he opened his account. Elena opened an account the same day as Noah. The amount of money E in her account is given by the function E equals 8 times W plus 60, where W is the, is the number of weeks since the account was opened. Who started out with more money in their account and explain how you know? Well, let's talk about Elena. When she opened her account, so she opened account or her account with $60. And the reason I know that is because the equation does not start at zero, zero. That makes this one not proportional. She saved 60 or she started with $60 and was adding $8 every single week. Based on what's given here. Let's talk about Noah. We see that Noah in his data, the very first point right here is 0, 060. So this tells us that Noah opened with 60 as well. So $60 here. And let's see how this works out. This would be 70 right here. And I see that that space of time until the next dot is going to, or the next graph point is two weeks. So that looks like $10 every two weeks. And so what I can think of with that is if he's saving $10 every two weeks, then we're saying that he saved $5 each week. Now, by going through the graph and going through the equation, understanding what the, the pieces and components are and what they mean helps me to understand who is actually saving more money, how much they started with, and just kind of what patterns we're, we're at with this. So who started out with more money in their account? Uh, neither. And the reason for that is because <clears throat> um, both started out with $60. I see that in the y-intercept of Elena's equation, and I see that in the y-intercept with Noah's uh, graphed values. So who's saving money at a faster rate? We would have to see right here that Elena is saving $8 per week and Noah is saving $5 per week. So we could say Elena, that's who saves money at a faster rate. There's my claim, my evidence, Elena saves $8 each week while Noah saves $5 each week. And if you're wondering, well, how did I know that? Well, I'm basing that on constant rate. Wow. The constant rate that we look at is just how the data is changing from point to point. So final question in the lesson is how much will Noah save over the course of a year if he does not make any withdrawals? And how long will it take Elena to save that much money? The important piece to know is if we're talking about over the course of the years, we have to know how many weeks that is. There are 52 weeks each year. And understanding that there are 52 weeks tells me that I can go like this for Elena. Is going to, her total amount of money is going to be 8 times $52 for a week plus 60. And then for um, Noah, let's go ahead and say let's let N be the amount of money in the account for Noah. And then his savings were $5.00 per week for 52 weeks, plus the $60 that he started with. 
Now it's perfectly accept acceptable to start with 60 and then add the constant rate to it as well. Go ahead and pull up our little helper here. And we see that we have eight times 52 is $416. plus 60 more dollars. So Elena will save $476 in a year. Or not, not per year, sorry. That was, this is what she saved, saves a total of $476 because if she keeps going past that year, she's only saving the $8. She doesn't perpetually save the $60 or begin with the $60 that we know of. Uh, when we talk about Noah, five times 52, Noah has saved $260 weekly plus the $60 that was already there. So we can say Noah saves a total of $320. And there you go. We have to be very careful to say how much money he's saving per year because the amount of money that they're saving per year is 416 and 260. The total amount of money is different because we have to add in what they started out with. So that's our lesson today. Uh, a lot of interpreting graphs, a lot of interpreting independent and dependent variables figuring out how to put things in there, how to write the equation, just how overall, how to compare the functions to each other. For your summary, suppose that a car is traveling 30 miles per hour, the relationship between the time and hours and distance in miles is a proportional relationship. We can represent this relationship with the equation in the form D equals 30 times T, where D is a function of time, because time simply depends on the distance, or excuse me, distance simply depends on the amount of time that you drive. Or we could write the equation like this as time is equal to 1 30th of distance. Now, what you notice with this is that we went from D equals 30 times T to T is equal to 1 30th times D. What these are are just reciprocals of each other where we recognize when distance is dependent on time, we're actually going at a faster rate. But when you want to reverse that, we can take time is equal to the the reciprocal of the constant rate times the distance. So it's just simply undoing what was done. So more generally, if we represent a linear function with the equation like y equals mx plus b, so in slope intercept form, then b is the initial value, it's where we start at, which is zero for the proportional relationship. So this could be like plus zero at the end. m is the rate of change in the function, if m is positive, the function's increasing. If m is negative, the function's decreasing. Pretty simply put. And if we represent the linear function in a different way, like with a graph, we can still use that same visual to represent and understand what those values of the slope and the y-intercept are. And if we need to, we can write an equation for the efficiency of finding what we need. That's it for today. Thanks for tuning in. Have a great day.